Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show. I'm your host, Paul. Bit of a different video for you guys today. Um, I don't know if you've been keeping up with the whole breakdown community on Twitter, but you might have seen recently that MT unfortunately got laid off at his job. Um, he's been looking for work, and you know, I immediately hit him up and was like, "Do you do you want to do something as part of the Heavy Spoilers Show?" Now, I know for a while that MT's wanted to do a big breakdown on Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, and I thought this is the perfect opportunity for us to just come together, make it work, and yeah, for this video, MT's going to be going through the whole movie scene by scene and pointing out all the Easter eggs in it. So yeah, really excited to work with another creator that I've watched for years and years and years. I really admire what the guy does, you know, he... He's helped me get better just by watching him, and I think he's so talented when it comes to this breakdown stuff. As I'm sure you can tell, we're very excited to get into it, and here's Heavy Spoilers Presents, MT's Breakdown of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. What's poppin', Jube Jubes? Welcome to the Heavy Spoiler Show. My name is MT from YouTube.com slash Mastertainment, and this is a breakdown of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. I am beyond excited to talk about the conclusion to the greatest trilogy in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, in my opinion, and I want to thank the spectacular spoiler man himself, Paul Spoilers, for giving me the opportunity to be a complete weirdo in front of all of you today on this spectacular channel. So let's get into it. Right at the very beginning, before the Marvel Studios logo starts flashing all the best MCU moments of the Guardians of the Galaxy, we can see the words Showtime A-Holes in script text, a direct reference to Star-Lord getting ready to fight the interdimensional Abelisk in Guardians 2, as well as Marvel's incredibly cheeky way of declaring showtime for the film. And this is then followed by Peter's Guardians 2 line about there being an unspoken thing, Drax's Guardians 2 line about there being two types of people in the universe, those who dance and those who do not dance, adult Groot's We Are Groot from Guardians 1, and both of Rocket's Guardians 1 lines of Jackass is standing in a circle and Ain't no thing like me except me. The latter being foreshadowing for the end of the movie when Rocket discovers he was wrong the entire time after he finds a cage of baby raccoons. Cause it turns out the High Evolutionary stole a bunch of animals from North America on Terra a long time ago, including a bunch of baby raccoons from the Columbus Wildlife Center. Though the first two letters in Columbus appear to have disappeared over time, so it kind of looks like Columbus Wildlife Center. But what I truly love about this part with all these baby raccoons embracing Rocket when he opens their cage is that this moment is a direct contrast to how the movie actually opens up, with the flashback to Rocket's own early days as a baby raccoon being deathly afraid of the coming approach of his abusive, apathetic god, the High Evolutionary, whose predatory hand towers over a fearful baby Rocket like a claw in a claw machine or an animalistic predator in the sky. Every single Guardians of the Galaxy movie has opened up with an important flashback for that movie's main captain of the Guardians. We got flashbacks to Meredith Quill's death and Peter Quill's abduction in Guardians 1, followed by a flashback of Peter's parents in Guardians 2. Now with Rocket ending this Rocket-centric movie as the captain of the Guardians, starting with a Rocket Raccoon flashback this time around, was very appropriate. Then after we see Rocket rapidly age up into the Rocket of the modern day, we can hear him listening to an acoustic version of Creep by Radiohead. But what I truly love about this moment is that it appears that Rocket only sings the parts of the song that he can personally relate to. Like when he sings, when you were here before, couldn't look you in the eye, you're just like an angel, your skin makes me cry. That makes me feel like Rocket is singing about Lila and his old disfigured friends who are now just like angels in the sky. Then Rocket sings, I'm a weirdo and I want to have control, I want a perfect body, obviously pointing to how he feels about his own self, his tragic past, and how he feels like he has no control over his life and his destiny. It's really super sad stuff, but it's also an incredibly clever use of this acoustic cover by James Gunn. But anyways, as Rocket walks around Nowhere, we can see that Nowhere has continued to grow as the Guardian city-sized haven for any lost alien soul who needs a home in the galaxy, especially since we last saw it in the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special. A special where we learn that the Guardians purchased the entirety of this empty celestial noggin from the Collector himself. Though I imagine that after Nowhere was destroyed by Thanos seven or eight years prior, he was more than eager to be rid of that place and the Guardians forever, because every time the Guardians show up, something bad happens to him. But man, it is really hard to believe that it has been nearly 12 MCU years since we first met the Guardians in 2014. But hey, the progress definitely shows. Their family has grown exponentially because that city is freaking huge. But anyways, Rocket walks past a Drax who claims that only idiots dance to a dancing mantis. This is not only a reference to his quote to Peter about 
those who dance and those who do not dance, but it's also a tease for the changed person that Drax will become by the end of the film, when he uses his idiotic dancing to bring joy to all of the star children. Then when Rocket observes Groot and Nebula hanging up a new Guardians of the Galaxy neon sign written in the galactic language of the Andromeda Galaxy, the man, the myth, the legend, Stephen Blackheart can be seen standing right behind them, returning to his role as steamy blue liver. Because remember that dispatcher dude on Nowhere that Drax threatened with a knife to contact Ronan in Guardians 1? He's back, and this time, he's got a gun! Stephen Blackheart is actually a close personal actor friend of James Gunn, and those two homies have worked together on a bunch of projects like PG Porn, Super, The Belko Experiment, Brightburn, and even Guardians of the Galaxy 2 when he played one of the alien Ravagers. More recently, Steven has played the pilot Briscoe in The Suicide Squad and the savage Charlie the Gorilla in Peacemaker, the greatest TV show of all time. I'm sorry, I don't make the rules, that TV show is just awesome. But anyway, Steven Blackheart is a fantastic man and he and I have been social media homies for years now as he has been a huge help on my hunt for the big missing Guardians of the Galaxy 1 Easter egg. So give Stephen Blackheart a follow at Blackheart on Instagram right now. That is a demand. He's a great man. Go like his pictures. But anyways, Rocket then enters a common eating area to a drunk Star-Lord wearing a shirt with an Orloni on it that says Space Candy. Star-Lord has apparently been getting blackout drunk extremely regularly as his not so great way of getting over his loss of Gamora. The fridge that Rocket approaches is apparently a massive fridge filled with milky fizz as that is the words written on the glass. And don't worry, it's not like carbonated milk or anything. That sounds disgusting and I would throw up right now. Carbonated milk would have definitely killed Rocket before Adam Warlock even got there. This milky fizz drink is apparently supposed to taste like desert pear soda water with cream. And it's something that people have actually tasted in real life at the Pim Test Kitchen at Avengers Campus in California. But anyways, I really dig the chandelier speakers on the ceiling in this eating area because it really shows just how much Peter Quill's love of music has been built into all of nowhere. Like there are speakers everywhere so everyone can dance at the end of the movie. I really like how James Gunn sort of symbolically filled Nowhere's celestial head with music, much like Meredith filled Ego's head with music when he was on Earth. It's kind of like history repeating itself in a symbolic way. But anyways, as a disappointed Nebula carries a passed out Peter, we get one of the last James Gunn slow walks of the MCU. Badass slow motion hero walks is one of James Gunn's favorite things in this world, and he's done it in every Guardians movie, as well as his newer DC projects like The Suicide Squad and Peacemaker. And also, fun fact about Chris Pratt in this shot, he's not actually in this shot. That's just a disturbingly lifelike Chris Pratt dummy that they made so Karen Gillan could bench the weight of a collapsed star lord. But if you just assumed that Karen Gillan was just swole like that, I wouldn't blame you. Karen Gillan's got the guns. But anyways, as Nebula puts Peter to bed, Peter whispers, I love you, Gamora, while grabbing Nebula's arm before Radiohead sings the words, I wish I was special, very much implying to me that Nebula might just be developing some slight romantic feelings towards Peter as she has been trying to take care of him for her dead sister Gamora. Throughout this entire movie, Nebula is extremely protective of Star-Lord while also bickering with him like a married couple, so I wouldn't be surprised if they ended up as the father and mother figures to all the citizens of nowhere down the line. I mean, Karen Gillan did recently tease Nebula's tiny crush on Star-Lord in an interview, so but definitely it feels likely that this was intentional by James Gunn. And Rocket even asked Nebula what she is going to do about Peter's drunk ass because Rocket is too busy dealing with his own emotionalistical issues. And Nebula seems to be the most concerned for Peter out of all of the whole Guardians family. But also, Rocket even acknowledging that he has emotional issues in the first place is definitely a shout out to Rocket's growth in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 when he learns that he doesn't have to be a jerk that pushes people away despite his trauma. But anyways, while those two talk, we of course get a sneak preview of the handy dandy gravity boots that Rocket will end up using to escape the high evolutionary's clutches at the end of the film. But then we are finally introduced to the true star of the movie, Cosmo the Space Dog, as played by actress Maria Bakalova. During a card game with her former collector jailmate, Howard the Duck, we learn in this movie that Cosmo is a little over 60 freaking years old and she was sent away on a rocket on a suicide science mission from Russia in 1966. And the 60s are, coincidentally, the era that Doctor Strange hints that the Fantastic Four were popular in in Multiverse of Madness. So I wouldn't be surprised if the Soviets were interested in that same weird cosmic energy readings in space that the Fantastic Four were 
in their origin story. But instead of sending humans into space like America did with the Fantastic Four, the Russians sent Cosmo into space to go check out those readings and then Cosmo got superpowers. But anyways, after Cosmo shows Kraglin up with her cool telekinesis powers by hitting targets engraved with the love bots of Contraxia from Guardians 2, we learn that there is a distinct difference between how Cosmo and Kraglin use their similar looking powers. When Kraglin declares Cosmo a bad dog because telekinesis is cheating. While Cosmo's powers are telekinetic in nature, Kraglin's use of Yondu's fin and arrow are not rooted in the mind, but the emotions of the heart, which is why the Yondu of Christmas Past shows up briefly towards the end of the film to remind Kraglin how to fly the arrow. He has to use his heart. It's sort of like a pathokinetic telekinesis in a way. It's very reliant on emotions. But anyways, as the Guardians try to figure out what to do with Peter's depression while eating some fried Orloni, Rocket suggests that Mantis use her powers to touch him to make him happy. But Groot, of course, takes it in the sexual way because Groot is a teenager who was raised by the inappropriate Star-Lord. And while this is a hilarious joke, this could also be a slight nod to Mantis's short time as a prostitute in the comics meant to showcase just how different this MCU version of Mantis is to these very outdated comics. But anyways, as Rocket gets prepared to go to sleep for a lot longer than he intended, we can see the same high evolutionary surgery scars on Rocket's back that we got a glimpse of when we first went to the Kiln Prison in Guardians 1. These back scars are a big reason why director James Gunn wanted to return to Marvel to finish the Guardians trilogy, because he always intended to tell Rocket's tragic backstory from the very beginning, because Rocket Raccoon has always been James Gunn's secret main protagonist of the trilogy, which is something that Lila's spirit hints at to Rocket later on in the film when she says the line, the story has always been yours, you just didn't know it. Then, as Crazy On You by Heart plays, we finally get the debut of Adam Warlock to the MCU after the Guardians 2 post credit scene had Aisha first begin his birthing process 11 to 12 years prior to the events of Guardians 3. Sporting his comic accurate red and yellow colors and skull on the chest, Adam Warlock glows with a golden fire very similar to Captain Marvel's. However, it looks like James Gunn decided to use a raccoon skull this time around, which I thought was a nice touch given Aisha and the Sovereign's disdain for Rocket's theft of their batteries in Guardians 2. And though Adam does appear to have a stone on his forehead like he does in the comics, this stone's purpose has yet to be revealed in the MCU, so we don't really know why that's there. But if I were to guess, I would assume that there was a, probably a tube or something attached to his forehead that was basically acting like an umbilical cord feeding him all of the energy into his body that he needed to become the ultimate highly evolved sovereign creature. And it also appears that Adam Warlock knew Rocket Raccoon's exact location before he even left the sovereign planet to go get him, likely using the high evolutionary's kill switch locked around Rocket's internal organs to find him. And then, as Adam faces off with Nebula, we can see Nebula's new and improved nanotech arm in action, an arm that she reveals later on was made for her by Rocket Raccoon himself, likely as a thank you for her gifting him Bucky's vibranium arm in the holiday special. Like, this arm definitely feels like Rocket was inspired heavily by Tony Stark and the Wakanda nanotechnology during his time on Earth with the Avengers. And I honestly wouldn't be surprised if Rocket repurposed Bucky's arm to make this new arm for Nebula. But anyways, the very flexible nanotech nature of Nebula's arm allows Nebula to transform it into a Mega Man-like arm cannon, a sword like Razor Fist from Shang-Chi, an electro shock cannon, a laser cutter, and even a weird suction arm. Like Lila said, it's always good to have friends, especially friends who can make your arm turn into a weapon. But anyways, at the end of Adam and Group's anime-style fight through the air, Adam destroys all of Groot's body except for Groot's head, which he mercifully drops to the ground instead of destroying it, both pointing to Adam's very kind nature underneath his douchey personality and confirming that the only thing that the Groot species needs to survive are their heads. And then when Nebula uses her superheated sword arm to stab Adam through the chest, Will Poulter's excellent delivery of that hurts was perfect because that was very likely the first time this godlike being had ever experienced true pain. But Nebula could not give a singular damn because all she knows in her life is pain, as she was the daughter of the very abusive Thanos. But anyways, as Rocket lies on the floor unconscious, we get a series of flashbacks to Rocket Raccoon's creation at Arete Laboratories on Counter-Earth, or Half-World. And in these flashbacks, we can see the letters 89P13 being tattooed onto Rocket's skin, with the prefix 89 referring to the High Evolutionary's Batch 89, which of course are Rocket's soon to be slain friends. <laughs> Floor, who is 89LO6, Tiefs the Walrus, who is 89A95, and Lila, who is 89Q12. 
Batch 89 appears to be heavily inspired by the Rocket Raccoon comics as the comic book Rocket Raccoon goes on adventures with Lila, Wal Russ, and a rabbit named Blackjack O'Hare. Rocket Raccoon's bestie, Wal Russ, was even teased in a Lovebot motel on Contraxia in Guardians 2. James Gunn literally had an artist recreate the second panel on page 3 of 1985's Rocket Raccoon number 2, possibly as a tease for Teefs in Guardians 3. And when the four caged friends all named themselves later on in the film, we finally learned why Rocket calls himself Rocket. It's after the dream he's always had of building a rocket to fly into the blue sky with all of his friends forever, which definitely makes the Guardians 2 moment of Rocket saying that he was cybernetically engineered to pilot a spacecraft hit a lot different in retrospect. Also, the inclusion of Mr. Blue Sky by the Electric Light Orchestra playing at the start of Guardians 2 as well. But anyway, speaking of the Rocket Raccoon comics, the Guardians then head to Orgo Corp's Orgoscope after Nebula connects to Rocket's vital data and learns of the existence of the High Evolutionary's Kill Switch Passkey. The outer design of the Orgoscope feels heavily inspired by the Space Wheel from the early Rocket Raccoon comics. In the comics, Space Wheel was the headquarters of Rocket Raccoon's maid adversary, Lord Divine, who ran a company called Divinities Incorporated, a company that made toys and killer clown robots. But in the MCU, Orgo Corp's Orgoscope is the bioformed science headquarters of Rocket Raccoon's maid adversary, the High Evolutionary, with bioformed meaning that the High Evolutionary grew the entire station out of living organic matter, which is why the whole station has a bunch of eyeballs and whatnot. Organic matter that I highly suspect to have come from the Collector's farming of Nowhere's biology for hundreds of years. I mean, both the Collector and the High Evolutionary are both super long-lived people after all, so I can definitely see them being in business for a very long time. But instead of making toys like Space Wheel did in the comics, Orgocorp has been providing cybernetic implants and genetic upgrades for anyone who will buy them for over 300 years. Mostly so the High Evolutionary can use all that money to fund all of his super messed up experiments throughout the universe. And Orgocorp is also known for having the most advanced cybernetic IP in the galaxy, including all the patents to every species the High Evolutionary has ever created himself, including the Animan, the Zeronians, the Sovereign, the Hellspawn, the Recorders, the Humanimals of Counter-Earth, and of course, all the failed experiments in between like Subject 89P13 of Batch 89. I kind of feel like Orgo Corp's species pat room has a lot of similarities to the Celestial World Forge from Eternals. Because like the Celestial God Erishim stores all the memories of his experiments in a massive library of neurons, the High Evolutionary sort of does the same thing by storing crucial memories within the neurons of these tiny pink brain balls that cyborgs like Nebula or the High Evolutionary's recorders can access with their computer brains. Anyways, in order to even get inside of Orgo Corp, Peter and Nebula have to work together to bypass Orgo Corp's invisible three-layered shielding, another element seemingly inspired by the early Rocket Raccoon comics, as Comic Rocket's home of Half-World had a giant Galatian wall surrounding the Keystone Quadrant that one needed to bypass to even get to the planet. But when the Guardians finally get past those Orgo Corp shields, they run into the United Ravagers, Yandu Udanta's old crew of Ravagers who all put aside their differences and reunited after Yandu's funeral. Though in Guardians 3, it seems that only Sylvester Stallone's Stakar, Michael Rosenbaum's Martin X, Kruger, and Mainframe are still together after all these years. With the voice actor for Miss Minutes, Tara Strong, pulling double MCU duty as Mainframe to fill in for Miley Cyrus this time around. Vin Rames as Charlie 27 and Michelle Yeoh's Aelita Ogord are noticeably absent. But picking up their slack is of course the newest member of the United Ravagers, Gamora 2 Multiverse Boogaloo, the Gamora from the alternate 2014 that Thanos emerged from in Avengers Endgame. This Gamora is noticeably different from the Gamora that we've known from the past two Guardians films because she lacks the valuable lessons in love and family that the original Gamora learned in those movies. This Gamora is purely the recently freed daughter of Thanos, who is living up to her reputation as the most dangerous woman in the galaxy. It is because of these lack of experiences that Gamora eventually snaps at Peter for trying to make her the lover that she never was by delivering one of the most important lines in the Guardians trilogy, in my opinion. What are you so afraid of in yourself that I need to be something for you? This line is super important because it touches on an important theme in Guardians 3, confronting one's fears. Both Rocket and Star-Lord started the Guardians trilogy running from their past parental traumas. But Star-Lord in particular 
had been using Gamora to fill the Meredith Quill-sized hole in his heart, instead of taking his ass back to Missouri and seeing the grandfather that he left behind. This new variant Gamora saw that desperation within Peter and called him out on it almost immediately after he kept pestering her about not being the dead Gamora. And good for her, quite honestly, because Peter really needed to hear that, much like he needed to hear Mantis and Drax's metaphor on how life is a pond and how Peter tends to hop from woman to woman like lily pads instead of learning how to swim, which is extremely reflected of the sea metaphor that Ego uses in Guardians 2 with Meredith Quill when he refers to Meredith as his river lily in the sea of his expansion. And while Ego and Peter were very different people at the end of the day, the one flaw that they have in common was spending their entire lives attaching to the love of random women for their own selfish reasons. The apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. Later on in the movie, while Gamora is listening to Alice Cooper's I'm Always Chasing Rainbows, trying to figure out exactly why Peter is always pathetically chasing her, she does the totally cool thing and looks through Peter's old backpack that he's had when he was kidnapped by Yondu at eight years old. A backpack with a NASA and Earth patch to showcase Peter's love for astronomy, a monkey, shark, and palm tree patch to show Peter's love of nature, and five Pac-Man ghosts to show Peter's love of arcade games like Pac-Man. I mean, Peter loves Pac-Man so much that he literally turned into Pac-Man while fighting Ego in Guardians 2. Though it is odd that Peter would have five Pac-Man ghosts instead of the classic four, considering that Kinky, the yellow Pac-Man ghost, wasn't introduced until 1996 Pac-Man arrangement, and Peter left Earth in 1988. However, since Pac-Man is always chasing these rainbow ghosts, they all definitely fit in with the theme of the song that is playing in this moment. Also, I don't know why they decided to name the yellow ghost Kinky, like, why would you do that? <laughs> like, really? Was there no board meeting about that? But anyways, inside of Peter's backpack, Gamora pulls out some ALF and Garbage Pail Kids trading cards, the Garfield books, Garfield Eats His Heart Out, and Garfield Takes the Cake, as well as a He-Man toy. Star-Lord's love for He-Man shows extra hard later on in the film when he calls the High Evolutionary a stretched face, Robocop-looking Skeletor wannabe, purple nurple piece of shit. Much like I call anyone who cuts me off, in Boston traffic. But most notably, we can see Peter's old report card from St. Charles Elementary in Missouri. Where we can see that Peter was getting C's in reading and social studies, D's in science and math, but a solid B in PE, with PE being the only class that he gets a favorable comment from a teacher, with the rest complaining of Peter's laziness in math, disruptive nature during reading, inappropriate comments during science, and talkative nature during social studies. This is all very much in line with Star-Lord's personality now, as he very much excels at physical feats more than anything else. But anyways, when Stakar pulls up with the United Ravagers, I love how the light from his suit makes it look like he has wings, because those light wings plus his blue and gold helmet definitely helps Stakar feel a lot like the Starhawk from the Marvel comics. But anyways, after the Guardians grab their disguises from Stakar and begin their Orgo Corp infiltration, they run into a number of James Gunn's favorite actors to work with, including Nathan Fillion as Orgo Sentry Captain Karja, who is actually returning to the Guardians trilogy after playing a monstrous inmate in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1, Jennifer Holland as the Orgo Scope Administrator Quoll, and Daniela Melchior, who plays the Krylorian that Peter flirts with named Ura. All three of these actors have roles in James Gunn's DC Universe as the Detachable Kid, Harcourt, and Ratcatcher 2, respectively. Though Nathan Fillion has recently been announced as Guy Gardner in James Gunn's new DCU. And honestly, that is probably the most baller casting I've heard in a long ass time. Like, not even gonna lie, Nathan Fillion was born for that role that is like RDJ levels of perfect casting. But moving on, as Gamora starts telling the Guardians what to do as they move throughout the Orgoscope, Gamora calls Mantis Bug, which is of course a comment on Mantis's antennas, but also a clever nod to one of the original members of Star-Lord's Guardians of the Galaxy team in the comics, Bug, who Marvel Studios could not use at all in their universe due to Bug being owned by Hasbro as part of the Micronauts property. But anyways, as the Guardians continue to move through Orgo Corp and eventually escape by lifting all the Orgo sentries off the ground, much like Rocket did with the Kiln prison guards in Guardians 1, we get another flashback of Rocket and the High Evolutionary as they listen to the High Evolutionary's favorite 5,000-year-old song, More Auguste Fon, More Egalone Fonote, featuring Ice Spice. If I just accidentally summoned a demon into your bedroom, I formally apologize. Latin is not my first language. A title that translates to, Be not as you are, but as you should be, which perfectly encapsulates the High Evolutionary's main mission of turning all the imperfect elements in the universe into one perfect symphony of science, which is why he refers to Rocket as a medley of mistakes later on in the film. To the High Evolutionary, he's not just making monsters, 
he's making music. And music is a big theme throughout the entire Guardians trilogy, so having an evil music man is very fitting. But when the High Evolutionary brings Rocket Raccoon to assess the aggression problem inside of his enraged mutant danger turtles that he made, Rocket points out that the problem was an overproduction of something called the Liga Beto Microsemeno protein, which is a real protein closely linked to aggression in animals like squids, as noted in a study conducted in 2011. This is when the High Evolutionary completely loses his fucking shit completely at the mere thought of one of his lowly experiments crafting an ingenious thought that he could not come up with himself. I really love how Chukwudi Awuji crawls on the ground like a predatory animal as he approaches Rocket's cage and again later on as he slowly approaches Rocket to berate him. Him crawling on the ground like an animal while Rocket stood upright was an excellent piece of imagery to show which one of them was truly the most evolved on the inside. But anyways, after the Guardians learned that Recorder Thiel, one of the High Evolutionary's most sadistic cyborgs responsible for Rocket's torturous past, who Peter bumped into during the Oracorp infiltration, downloaded and deleted the pass key before the Guardians got to it first, the Guardians resolved to head to Counter-Earth despite Gamora selfishly warning them not to. And much like Drax did with Ronan in the first film, Gamora ends up making a selfish phone call that ends up alerting Aisha and Adam to the Guardian's location. And as the Guardians fly over the surface of Counter-Earth, Peter discovers that it is a near-perfect recreation of planet Earth circa the 1980s, the same era that Peter left his planet Earth. And according to the film and director James Gunn on Twitter, the High Evolutionary visited Counter-Earth one time in the 1980s and was so impressed with Earth's culture that he decided to base the entirety of Counter-Earth on his loose memories of that visit, which is why we can see a version of the Statue of Liberty remade to include the High Evolutionary and a monkey, and why all the people, architecture, cars, and home decor all look super retro. I really hope there was a Night Monkey No Way Home scenario that happened at that Statue of Liberty, because that would have been hilarious. But since we do know that the High Evolutionary did visit the Earth in the 1980s, I am curious about whether or not he teamed up with Advanced Idea Mechanics or any type of Earth genius during his visit, because if you remember in Iron Man 3, Aldrich Killian had an entire map of the universe at his disposal, a map that he shows Pepper very briefly. That map could have easily been gifted to AIM by the High Evolutionary in the 1980s before AIM was even made into a company. He probably found a group of geniuses who was like, hey, you guys are unethical like me, here's a map to the universe, sky's the limit. <laughs> But anyways, as the Guardians land on Counter-Earth, you can see a little baby warthog watching the ship descend while holding a little high evolutionary plushie, blissfully unaware that they're about to die at the hands of the very plushie that they're holding. And I really love how James Gunn had that rabbit man yell Nanu Nanu at the Guardians after Drax absolutely eliminates a little girl with a ball, as it is a clear reference to Robin Williams' famous catchphrase as the alien Mork in 1978's Mork and Mindy. And then when the people of Counter-Earth start throwing rocks at the Guardians, Nebula tells Groot to go full kaiju mode, which is a direct reference to Groot's first ever Marvel appearance as a massive kaiju monster in the pages of 1960's Tales to Astonish number 13, and a tease to the massive person that Groot becomes at the very end of the film. Then after the Guardians make themselves a little bit too comfortable in Neely the Vampire Bat's Humanimal's home, Peter draws Neely his beautiful rendition of what Recorder Thiel looks like. Now. Listen to what Neely says in reaction to seeing Recorder Thiel's face. Motio. His name? His name is Motio? Ew. Ew. Neely says Mojo and then shakes her head when Peter pronounces it as Motio. I believe this is super important because I believe this is Recorder Thiel's true purpose in Guardians 3. I believe that James Gunn is using Recorder Thiel and a bunch of elements in Guardians 3 to set up the origin of Mojo in the MCU. Now hear me out here because it's not just some bat lady saying a name that points to a possible Mojo origin in Guardians 3. The cyborg Recorder Thiel's deeply sadistic personality towards Rocket and all of the High Evolutionary's mutated animals and star children appears to very much mirror the very deep love and fascination with torturing mutants that the super fleshy and disgusting spineless cyborg Mojo has in the comics. And when you consider just how much alike the High Evolutionary's controller pilot of the Ariete Laboratories looks oddly similar to the Mojo design in the comics, it definitely feels likely to me that we could see Recorder Thiel's cyborg data re-downloaded and his body reconstituted at Orgocorp, using some of that Orgocorp flesh to make his new fleshy spineless body, before adopting the very name that all the humanimals call him as his own. Mojo. But that's just a theory. A Mojo theory. But anyway, speaking of Thiel and the Star Children, 
Phyla can be seen defying gravity as she runs in front of the High Evolutionary on a high-tech hamster wheel as the High Evolutionary tells Recorder Thiel that his mutated star children have the ability to survive extremely happily on 30 calories a day and an hour of sleep a week, and yet still be able to rewrite a Carbonatrix core in under two hours without getting hangry. So Phyla and the rest of her mutated friends are as super smart as they appear to be powerful. And it's also very fitting that Phyla is a star child considering that she will ultimately become the hero Quasar in the MCU much like she is in the comics. But anyways, when the Guardians finally arrive at Arete Laboratories, with Arete, of course, being the Greek word for excellence and self-actualization, they're greeted by two of the most badass-looking characters in all of MCU history, Behemoth, played by Ronaldo Fabrell, and my personal favorite, Warpig, as played by actress Judy Greer, who, of course, has also played Maggie Lang in the Ant-Man films. Like, I am beyond upset that Warpig was killed off in this movie. Marvel, if you're listening, just... Just put War Pig's head back on her body and then put her on the new Guardians team. She's way too badass looking to stay dead in my opinion. Like, come on. I know she's probably fried bacon on the surface of the planet, but, you know, you can just retcon that. It's just fine. <laughs> and when the High Evolutionary finally faces off against Peter and Groot, he tells them of his plans to destroy Counter-Earth like he's done many times before on other planets that he's created. Very much like his comic book counterpart did to Counter-Earth, in 2015's Uncanny Avengers number 2 by Rick Remender, thus deepening the high evolutionary similarities to the MCU celestial Erishim the Judge, who has threatened to bring the same type of destruction to Earth if the Eternals' memories show him things that he does not like. However, when the high evolutionary actually initiates the destruction of Counter-Earth and Adam Warlock flies to save Aisha, a detail about this moment that is very easy to overlook is that Aisha did not choose to leave her spaceship without her son, Adam. Though Aisha was literally one of the douchiest people to ever exist in the universe, who repeatedly wanted to kill Adam's adorable new pet Fasaki blurp throughout the movie, we do get a deep sense that she truly cared for both her science experiment of a son and her people. Like she wasn't a completely heartless being. She was just an asshole. But speaking of blurp, this isn't the first time the Fasaki race has appeared in the MCU, as a hairless Fasaki can be seen eating a bunch of Orloni at a bar in nowhere as the Guardians wait for the Collector. And also, fun fact about Nowhere in Guardians 3, the coordinates to Nowhere are actually different from the coordinates that we get in Guardians 1. This is of course because of the mobile nature of the Nowhere installation, thanks to the upgrades that Peter and the Guardians have installed on this giant celestial head. It can move now. But moving on, after Peter pushes Recorder Thiel off of the Arete Labs and Groot starts growing his tree wings, we can actually hilariously see Peter and Groot falling behind Nebula, Mantis, and Drax as they all desperately tried to enter Arete Laboratories to save Peter and Groot. It really is quite the hilarious blink and you'll miss it visual gag. But anyways, once Peter and Groot finally make it back onto their ship to a rocket at death's door, we can see what appears to be the MCU's latest depiction of the afterlife. After first being introduced to the concept in Black Panther and then having the afterlife concept further explained to us as untethered consciousness by Tawarat in Moon Knight. Because in the MCU, it appears that one's afterlife is highly dependent and what that person personally believes heaven to be. Wakandans believe in the ancestral plane, so all the Wakandans go there when they die. The Kree believe in the supreme intelligence, so all the Kree join the collective supreme intelligence consciousness when they die. Mark Spector believed in Egyptian mythology due to his connection with Khonshu, so his afterlife was the Field of Reeds. Rocket's afterlife is a similar situation in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, because heaven to the tortured prisoners like Rocket, Lila, Floor, and Teefs very much looks like a bunch of open cages within a bright and infinite white sky. Because that is literally what all four of them dreamed of all the time, being free in the open sky. But what is super special about this particular afterlife case is that Rocket Raccoon had a choice whether or not to keep on living. Because after Lila says that Rocket can join her, Floor, and Teefs in the afterlife, Rocket breathes out a sigh of relief because he can finally leave that meaningless universe behind. And it is that sigh of relief that directly leads to his flatlining in the film. And as soon as Rocket flatlines, Peter screams at his side much like he did as a kid while watching his mother Meredith die, and also like he did with Yondu in Guardians 2 when he died. However, it is Lila herself who proves to be the movie's greatest hero as her words to Rocket about what gives life meaning is what sends his untethered consciousness falling down from the sky and back into his body. There are the hands that made us, 
And then there are the hands that guide the hands. And that is when Lila became one of my favorite MCU characters of all time. Like what an incredibly selfless and loving soul she was, even in death. She missed Rocket, but still let him go. That takes a lot of strength. But anyways, once Mantis, Drax, and Nebula finally make their way inside of the Arete, they run into the holding cells for all of the High Evolutionary's star children. Cells that appear to include drinking tubes filled with the same mysterious yellow liquid that the High Evolutionary appears to have injected Rocket with at the start of the film to trigger Rocket's evolutionary growth. This liquid is probably what has helped the Star Children evolve into the super powerful beings that Phyla appears to be at the end of the movie. I have a feeling that this yellow liquid could potentially be linked to the same yellow evolutionary power found in the Sovereign's Anulax batteries, or Harbillary batteries if you speak French, which is why Rocket knew that the Sovereign batteries could cause a chain reaction throughout Ego's nervous system in Guardians 2. This is honestly why I believe that the Guardians 3 logo is yellow this time around, because Guardians 3 is all about the concept of evolution, and it's the same reason why the Eternals logo is golden yellow as well. Because much like that yellow MCU energy caused Rocket and Phyla's mutations in Guardians 3, yellow MCU energy also helped the Deviant Crow evolve after he shoved a swirly straw inside of both Ajax and Gilgamesh and drank the yellow solar energy inside of their bodies that they all got inside of their bodies after sitting in front of Earth's yellow star for so long at the beginning of the movie. This could be why the High Evolutionary calls his children his star children because of the star energy inside of this yellow juice. Not just because that they were his star pupils, but also because he used the evolving radiation energy from yellow celestial suns to make his evolution juice. So much like the Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 logo was blue and red to denote the blue and red energies of Ego's planet, the Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 logo is gold and yellow to denote the concept of evolution. That's just a theory. But anyways, when Star-Lord calls Kraglin and Steamy to bring Nowhere to the Arete, we can see Kraglin playing cards with both Seth Green's Howard the Duck and the Broker from Guardians 1, played by Christopher Fairbank. But what my favorite part about Nowhere rescuing all the people and animals of the Arete is that Nowhere is actually fulfilling the purpose that the Collector originally had it for. Because we learn in a Guardians 1 interview from Benicio Del Toro that the Collector's collection on Nowhere was meant to be a Noah's Ark type of act of altruism. Because the Collector foresaw a coming catastrophe in the universe that was going to jeopardize all life. So he started collecting a bunch of living beings like Noah did in the Bible in order to save them. That's a real creepy way of going about things, Tanelier, but hey, everyone needs a hobby. Then of course we get the return of the interdimensional Abelisk creatures from Guardians 2 who regularly emerge from the cracks in reality around Sovereign to feed on the yellow evolution Anulex energy irradiating from their planet. Like one of my favorite parts about Mantis' personality is her immense kindness and empathy, and I truly love how Mantis uses her kindness and empathy to calm these Abolus creatures down because it perfectly exemplifies what makes Mantis so unique. Mantis is a truly selfless being who cares so much about defending others. Like when Rocket got hurt, she attended to Rocket even though her own arm was broken, she yells at Nebula for pushing Drax, and she spends the entire movie trying to heal the hole in Peter's heart by pushing Peter to return to Earth. If anyone is the truest guardian of the galaxy, it is Mantis in my opinion. Because Mantis has an extremely protective heart that has always known that all life has meaning. And that is what it truly means to be a guardian of the galaxy. And that's why Rocket chose to spare the high evolutionary's life in the end, and why Groot told Adam that everyone deserves a second chance. Because the guardians of the galaxy would not exist if they weren't all given a second chance to be better people. Those merciful words to Adam Warlock would affect Adam Warlock greatly and then cause him to start to become the merciful Adam Warlock that we know from the comics. James Gunn having Peter and Adam recreate Michelangelo's creation of Adam while Adam saves Peter was such a nice touch because of this. But anyways, when Rocket and the High Evolutionary finally face off, the High Evolutionary shoves Rocket against the wall with his favorite anti-gravity powers that appear to be rooted within his suit. A suit that behaves very similarly to Kang's suit in Quantumania, especially when Kang used that suit to torture Cassie and Scott. But when the Guardians overpowered the High Evolutionary and take off his face, I don't think that this was just meant to expose the true monster underneath the High Evolutionary, but I also believe that this was Marvel's way of setting up the origin of the High Evolutionary's iconic purple mask that he always wears in the comics for later films. Because it doesn't look like his skin mask is going to stick on his face if you uh, look at it in the deleted scene. But anyways, as the Guardians escape the Arete with all the freed prisoners, 
Mantis opens a cage for a tiny abomination that scares her. This monstrous creature is actually played and voiced by director James Gunn. If you haven't seen the raw footage of this moment, I highly recommend that you do because it is hilarious and James Gunn's squat walking is just straight comedy. Both the Gunn brothers have amazing knees. And while Peter heads to deactivate the shield so everyone can make it across to nowhere, he runs into a bug-eyed alien with a gun. This alien is named Flectic and he is played by Mr. Steel Yo Girl himself, Pete Davidson, who of course worked with James Gunn in the past on the Suicide Squad as the short-lived Blackguard. But anyways, as the movie wraps up, Peter's journey throughout the movie leads him to finally decide to stop running from his fears and announce his return to Earth, which then inspires Mantis to face her own fear of going off on her own for the first time ever since Ego and the Guardians, which then forces Drac to confront his own fear of losing another daughter figure in his life after Ronan killed his daughter before Guardians 1. He wanted so badly to protect Mantis, but he was forced to let her go do her own thing, just like Peter had to face his fear of letting Gamora go. And Nebula herself faced her fear of vulnerability when she admits that she needs Drax with her to be a father figure for nowhere after she spent the entire movie being a crabby blueberry who rejects help from almost everyone. Like all the Guardians of the Galaxy grow so much during this film. I freaking love it. And of course, the biggest surprise of this movie is when Groot says, I love you guys to all of his friends. Though a lot of people assume that this was Groot finally learning to say words beyond I am Groot, this is actually not the case. Groot is actually saying I am Groot in this moment, but James Gunn purposely made us understand Groot because we have spent so much time with Groot since 2014. So much like Gamora began to understand Groot at the end of the film, the audience has begun to understand him as well. But anyways, when Peter finally arrives back on Earth and enters his grandfather's house in Missouri, we can see all of Meredith Quill's music records and memories against this wall. But right next to a picture of her and Peter, we can see a framed image that says, everything grows with love. I believe this is a clear reference to Ego the Living Planet and how Ego used Meredith's love to grow all of his evil tumor plants. As we can see when Meredith and Ego kiss at the beginning of Guardians 2. It is love that fueled Ego's expansion and he needed Peter's heart to do that. And finally, much like in Guardians 2, Guardians 3 ends with a shot of rocket. Because much like Lila says in the movie, the story has been rockets all along. But anyways, thank you guys so much for watching this breakdown of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. And I want to thank Paul once again for his super generous and kind soul for giving me the opportunity to do this amazing breakdown on his amazing channel. Guardians of the Galaxy has meant a lot to me as a human being, and it's taught me a lot of lessons about the importance of human connection and love. So getting to do this breakdown has been an absolute dream come true. You rock, Paul. I love you so much. You're the best. But anyways, if you want to hear more of my weird voice, please go subscribe to my YouTube channel, Mastertainment, or you can follow me at Mastertainment on Twitter or X or whatever the hell Twitter's called, I don't know. If you guys want to see me post some weird shit, because I be posting weird shit all day. But of course, most importantly, do not forget to subscribe to Heavy Spoilers. Paul is one of the absolute best in the game, so you don't want to miss any of his breakdowns ever. So hit that subscribe button right now. But anyways, thanks again so much for watching this video. I love you guys so much, and I hope to see you guys again in the future. Ta-ta! And remember that all life has meaning, so be kind to one another, okay? Okay. I'm watching you. Ha <laughs> ha!